Okay. So this is the meeting of outreach communications and appointments, and I am calling us to order at 9.37 a.m. Uh, so you have several documents in your packet, including the agenda. Uh, there are, I have no announcements for today. Uh, and so we will jump right to agenda item three, which is discussion of the sufficiency of the pool for the ZBA vacancy. Well, it says vacancy, but there are multiple. Um, so let's just sort of recap where we are with the ZBA. So we've had one vacancy on the ZBA since September 11th of 2019, and that was a vacancy of one of the regular member seats. Uh, at the time that that occurred, we decided to hold off on filling that vacancy because they were able to use their associates, and so that vacancy we felt did not impose any type of significant burden on the body. We then, in December, received notice that the ZBA chair, Mark Parent, who had been uh, reappointed to a one-year term ending June 30th, 2020, was going to uh, resign his seat early on March 13th. Uh, I am not quite sure what the status is of that. Uh, the last conversation that I had heard of with Mark was that he had been impaneled for the current ZBA hearing on the University Drive South project. Um, and that he was going to stay on the ZBA beyond the 13th for the remainder of that. Um, and so I don't know how much longer that will run for, um, but he is at the very least uh, has rescinded his resignation letter, to the best of my knowledge, um, temporarily so that he can complete um, that panel for that project. Uh, I know there had been some conversation about if he's willing to stay on for the remainder of that project, would he just be willing to stay on for the remainder of his term? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. But um, f at this point in time, we are not expecting that Mark Parent is actually going to be stepping down on the 13th. He will at least be carrying out um, the remainder of that project. Alyssa. I have a quick question since the, since the ZBA was, even though Mark's been on in a long time, the ZBA was recently confused as to who resigns to what at any given moment, and they, you don't resign to your staff support, for example, you resign to the town clerk. And so if he did resign to the town clerk, I hope he rescinded it with the town clerk as well. It's very typical that when people are on ZBA that they stay for a particular project just to see it through and say, D I'm not sitting through anything else, mm -hmm. but I'm staying on that one. And, but legally, if he's resigned, uh, it just calls questions. So yeah. I hope that we can ask staff to follow up on that just to make sure that the yeah. town clerk feels like if they were asked, yeah. that he's still officially impaneled for that purpose. I can, I can check in on that. The last communication that I had seen, and I'm recalling this from memory, um, was that he had, um, said to Maureen, how do I rescind my resignation okay. um, so that I can continue to serve for the remainder of this? Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't think Maureen knows the answer to that. And I, and, I th and I think, and again, this is from memory, I'd have to dig through my email a little bit. I think that I saw the communication as part of a reply from the town manager to Maureen, instructing her how to right. instruct Mark how to do this. Um, but I, ha I haven't seen any communication to the town clerk from Mark. Um, so I can just follow up on that. Um, we can ask him what he feels. Right. We feel like it's this fun game of telephone. Later. Yeah. yeah. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm slightly less concerned about uh, that second vacancy of the regular membership because we do know we have Mark at least for the somewhat foreseeable future. Uh, however, we then recently received a letter of resignation uh, from Aaron Arcello, who is one of our associate members. Um, and his resignation is effective immediately. Uh, and so our one vacancy turned into two vacancies, has turned into potentially three in the near future. Um, and so I don't think we're at a point anymore where we can say, oh, that vacancy doesn't impose a burden on the body. Um, and so the priority for today's discussion is um, whether or not we are ready to move forward um, with interviews to fill that ZBA vacancy. 
Now, the last time we had this conversation, if you recall, I said that it would be very difficult for us to assess the sufficiency of the pool because we did not have a pool. Um, and so we had a discussion, uh, I believe this was at our February 10th meeting, about how we might be able to increase numbers in the applicant pool um, beyond zero. So we had uh, at the, the, this body um, decided, one by consensus and one by vote, on two recommendations to try to increase recruitment for ZBA. One was to reach out to all of the planning board members, uh, all of the people who applied to be on the planning board, but did not also check off ZBA. So several people had applied for both, but there were a handful of people who had applied for planning board and not ZBA. Um, and there was a request that I reach out to those planning board people and ask if they would be interested in the ZBA. There was also a recommendation that I reach out to the town manager and ask him to come up with a list of people who he has interviewed for other town committee bodies that we haven't seen um, that he thinks would be good people to be on the ZBA or might be interested in the ZBA um, and ask him to reach out to them and encourage them to submit a CAF. Uh, I reached out to the town manager. He told me that he did that. Um, and so as a result of those two efforts, I think as you've noticed in your inboxes, uh, we have seen an increase in applications. And so I do think that we're at a point where we can actually look at the pool um, and decide whether we want to move forward. And so I want to do this sort of in, in two stages. The first is looking at the document that's in your packet on three, ZBA sufficiency of the pool. Um, and the second will be to look at the actual applicant pool and see if we want to vote to move forward. So let's start with that document. Darcy. And do we have a, a date set for interviews? We don't. I'm not going to schedule one until um, we decide we want to move forward. Okay. This is, this is probably going to be a little more complicated than with planning board, um, just based on numbers, but that's one step at a time. Okay. It would be great if we had a specific, like this is a good time to have pulled up all the normal documents that you see on there. Just a small, a quick snapshot of what you have. Do you want to find it? No, again, <laughs> how's that on the agenda? Oh, they can't God. handle five hours of discussion with someone, so we need to have a snapshot of what you have. All right, so, um, so you have a document which is, uh, labeled uh, sufficiency of the pool discussion. Uh, it looks very similar to the document that we looked at for planning board um, back on January 5th, January 4th. Um, and so the first page of this is just the relevant text from the adopted OCA process uh, to remind us that before we can proceed to interviews, we have to by majority vote declare the applicant pool sufficient uh, remember, we did not decide on any hard criteria by which to evaluate whether a pool is sufficient, um, but we did put uh, goals that we strive towards. So we strive towards more applicants and vacancies, we strive towards a diverse applicant pool, and we want to make sure that the applicant pool has some people that meet the current needs of the body to be appointed, and we want to consider any burdens on that body. Uh, the second page is an attempt to get at uh, some of those questions. And so uh, the first thing is that we need to make sure that the, uh, there's been a vacancy notice published for at least 14 days before we move forward um, for an appointment. The vacancy notice was published on September 12th, so it has been 14 days. I also republished the vacancy announcement the first week in February. Um, so actually that vacancy announcement has been published twice. Uh, the next thing is that the OCA chair designee shall compact any applicant who submitted their CAF uh, prior uh, two years prior to the posting of the vacancy notice. I did that. Uh, I did that back in February, uh, which yielded very little. And so then we went through the process of reaching out to more people that I described earlier. So then as far as these three criteria, uh, the number of applicants relative to the number of vacancies uh, we can confirm that there are more applicants than there are current vacancies. Uh, as far as demographic data, we can look at that in a minute, but that is on page four presented as we usually do or, uh, so that you 
we, we're not saying the specific numbers, but you can look at percentages. Um, and then I wanted to just make sure we understand the current needs of the body, including any burden placed on it. So again, this is a body that technically has five regular member seats and four associate member seats. Uh, we appointed five regular members and three associate members uh, last spring. We left one of those associate seats uh, open. At this point, we have uh, two vacancies in our associate members um, and two current associate members in their seats. And we have one vacancy and an impending second vacancy of regular members. Uh, what that basically means is that of the nine potential seats, uh, we are soon to be in a position where only five will have people in them. Uh, because you need five people on the panel, um, that puts the ZBA in a very precarious position. Um, and in conversation with staff about the ZBA and when they're looking at their current members' uh, travel schedules, especially for the summer because Amherst is Amherst, uh, there is a lot of concern that without some new members, uh, the work of the ZBA could grind to a halt uh, because they just won't have the five people to sit on a panel um, with some travel schedules. And of course, with only five people, that also brings up concerns about if there's someone who has a conflict, if there's someone who's sick. Um, to some extent, what's on our agenda tonight about the Mullen rule uh, provides a little bit of cushion for that, um, but certainly not much. And so my personal opinion on this, and this is again personal, but I think is, is reflected by some of the conversations I've heard from staff, is that uh, if there are, if these, once these three vacancies occur and there are only five seats of nine filled, combined of associate and regular, uh, that is actually a pretty significant imposition on the ZBA and, and could pretty dramatically impact their work. Uh, with regard to the needs, I have on page three, um, I, as per our process, I reached out to the chair of the plan, uh, sorry, the chair of the ZBA to ask for um, what he sees as the needs and skills that uh, the body currently needs. They probably look very familiar to you, and the reason for that is I said, at this moment in time, uh, what are the current needs of the ZBA? And he said, here is what I sent to you last time. Um, and so I assume it's just that's what the current needs remain, um, that this is identical to what we received last spring. Uh, and then again, the final page is the demographic data. You will see that we do have uh, some diversity as a, uh, in far as the age, ages of our uh, applicants, certainly more so than we had from the planning board. Uh, when it comes to gender and race, uh, we are again looking at a pool that is exclusively white men white and Caucasian men. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to get called for. Um, so before we look at names, I just want to open up the floor to any comments or discussion about this document and specifically about um, diversity and the needs of the body and the burden placed on the body and, and how we're feeling about um, whether when it comes to numbers, needs, burdens, and diversity, uh, we're comfortable moving forward. So, thoughts? Hands up. Okay. So, Darcy. I just want to add my regular comment of that I would like to add to the diversity bullet. Um, whether the person rep is uh, uh, represents an unrepresented voice, so you want or to underrepresented. But what does that mean? Uh, it means that because certainly women and racial minorities would be underrepresented voices. Yes. In this body. Um, I guess I'm talking political voices. So you want to, in, with race and gender, you also want to put politics? Well, voice, uh, including a racial, economic, gender, or an, and generational div diversity, or an unrepresented voice on the body. 
under underrepresented voice on the body so i think i think and here i understand what you're getting at which is five number five on our agenda tonight different perspectives on town council appointed body ok so we'll get to that for that agenda item um, ok so with that so similar to what we did for planning board i am going to be handing out uh... what our current pool is uh, because per our adopted policy, we don't disclose numbers or names. This is not a public document. I will be collecting it at the end of our discussion. Uh, the point of this is for you to take a moment to look at how many people we have, who they are, considering in the context of what Mark Current says uh, he feels like the body needs. Um, so take a moment to look it over, and then we will have a conversation about uh, whether or not we feel that the pool is sufficient. Alyssa has pointed out that I made an error in the CAF dates in that some of these people have applied in the future. Uh, anything that is 2020 should be 2019. They should all be 2019, um, except for except for the February and March submissions of 2020. If, so why don't we just do this? If it's a date that's in the future, it was supposed to be 2019. Okay, so we all be looking at this document. Okay, so remember we don't speak names or numbers, um, but do we have any, given the document that I provided uh, in the packet and given this document, I'd like to open up the floor to any comments regarding whether or not uh, we feel that we have a pool that is sufficient to move to interviews. But the one thing I do want to make sure I, I include in the framing of this discussion is the fact that while we do have two current vacancies and will have a third in the uh, likely near future, uh, that does not necessarily mean that we need to fill all three vacancies um, in this round of appointments. And so we, we need to make sure that the body is operable, 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be able to see in this pool the capability of filling three full vacancies uh, because we can interview everyone and decide to only fill one of the vacancies or two. Um, but, but we do want to make sure that the, the body is not uh, impeded from operating. So opening up the floor to uh, opinions from members of this committee about whether you feel as though, given the information presented, the pool is sufficient to proceed to interviews. George. I feel the pool is sufficient to proceed to interviews. Okay. Darcy? I think it's unfortunate that there are no women who applied, but it seems like there are plenty of applicants and, uh, um, and it does seem sufficient to me, other than needing women. <laughs> I agree. Minorities. Yeah, agreed. And, and, as, and, and as you see from the contact, um, some women were contacted, um, w one of which did not respond, but also uh, in conversation with staff, uh, there was a thought that she is not an Amherst resident. Um, there's some confusion about that. And the other uh, I reached out to via, via email and then also followed up with an in-person conversation uh, trying to convince her to apply uh, unsuccessfully. So I think that that will continue to be a, a difficulty for this body. So, so I guess what I'm saying is not for lack of trying, <laughs> but... Um, but it is, it is an unfortunate situation that uh, in the guidance that Mark Parent provided us, he did specifically call out another woman and uh, uh, someone who represents a minority. And uh, this pool currently has neither of those. Other thoughts on this pool? Alyssa. We don't seem to have a copy of our Cello's resignation. And if that resignation said anything other than I resign, if it said I resign because there aren't any women on this body or I resign because this, that, or the other thing, that would be useful information for us to have in determining sufficiency of the pool. Okay. And the entire town council should have received a copy of that. Again, there's confusion about resignations. Right. I mean, they should have gotten it. Like, the clerk gets it. Like, that's the important part. But since the town council appoints this, we should know when people Quit right. because most people again say I quit <laughs> or I'm busy. But if they said something more provocative, that would be worth knowing to make this decision. I, I can and I can. If you have a copy of it, I know you're going to. I do. I. I. Yes, and yeah. I'd have to search for a copy, but I can try and dig it out. Um, but uh, what I will say is that um, Aaron Arcello has resigned because he has taken a job in Wisconsin that has made it uh, difficult for him to continue service on the board um, from Milwaukee. So, um, yes. So right now are two resignations that have gone into effect. One was Matthew Wilk who resigned uh, because of a capacity question and, and workload. And the other was Mr. Arcello who resigned um, because he took a job out of state. George. What about Alyssa's uh, observation that since these are town council appointments, it would seem to be appropriate that councillors be apprised of resignations when they occur, um, not just members of this committee, but all councillors. Is that something that we will continue to look into? Is that something that we feel, as long as the chair knows and communicates it to us, um, or is it something that, that I should know and I was, I was told and I just forgot, which is probably the, the, the answer, but um, how, how do we ensure, should we ensure that this kind of information, once it goes to the clerk, gets communicated to the council as a whole? It seems to be what Alyssa, Alyssa is suggesting here and it doesn't happen. Uh, Athena. I'm, I'm going I'm to ask the, the town clerk staff to make sure that they send a copy. They should be sending a copy of resignation letters to other appointing authorities, so I'm just going to follow up with them to make sure that they know that those bodies are appointed by the council and that they send me the resignation letters so I can send them out to you all. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think this also has to do with just making sure uh, that staff liaisons are aware in 
you know, the short time that I've been doing this when I've seen resignations that people are almost always submitting their resignation to the staff liaison, mm -hmm. um, which I think probably makes sense because that's the town hall person they interact with most. Um, and so I think that that staff liaison, making sure that they're also aware that when they receive that, um, it needs to either go to the town clerk and then, then it comes to the council, so yeah. Okay, um, so I have heard from George and Darcy a feeling that this pool is sufficient to move to interview. Uh, Sarah and Alyssa, do you have any thoughts? Alyssa? Same as what Darcy said, it, it is what it is. <laughs> okay, so then with that, I will entertain a motion. The motion would be to declare that the applicant pool for the Zoning Board of Appeals is sufficient to proceed to interview. George? I so move. Okay, George has moved. Is there a second? second? Thank you, Alyssa. Alyssa has seconded. Then this needs to be a majority vote. All the, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, and that is unanimous. Uh, so if you could hand these papers back to me. Photographic memory. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if you had. <laughs> That's I, that they're just going there second. Yeah. yeah. Sean just said that the Wi-Fi should be working. So if you want, y'all want to check. Okay. Is everyone connected at this point? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so um, we have now declared the applicant pool sufficient. And so we have, uh, just as a reminder, even though we very recently did this, uh, our next steps are to schedule interviews. Um, and so I am going to reach out to all of the applicants who are in the pool and try to find a date where they are all available and we are all available because there are more than there were for planning board. It might be more complicated than last time. That was a great practice run. <laughs> um, I, am pr I am going to shoot for the same uh, day of the week and time that the ZBA meets as we did with planning board. Um, but I will ultimately try to choose a decision that works best for all parties. Which um, is when? I have no idea right now. Oh wait, when is the? When do they usually meet? The ZBA meets every other Wednesday, right? Yeah, I, I recently looked at it too, but now I'm blanking. Um, I, I will send out some information to try and get because I also want to make sure all of us can be there. Um, so I am going to do my best to schedule that interview in the near future. Um, Alyssa. I, was just, I mean, I can look it up separately and we can come back to it, but um, we might want to, before we leave here, if there's a particular Wednesday that none of us are going to be here, I mean, you might as well not offer that to candidates kind of thing. That is a good point. Normally meet there. Should remind me of this. Um, hold on, y'all. I'll look this up. Yeah. So actually, uh, my mistake. It does look like their meetings are Thursdays. 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 Right, I don't. I had Wednesday in my head, um, probably because I was thinking about planning board, um, and then I had Tuesday in my head because I think that's when their administrative meetings are, uh, which are different. So, Thursday night. Thursday nights, yeah. Um, so I will. So why, why don't we actually do Alyssa's suggestion now? So I am I am likely going to try to schedule it for the same time, when ZBA meet on Thursdays. Uh, Thursday nights, it looks like 6 p.m. Yeah. is when they meet, um, on a, obviously on a Thursday when the ZBA is not meeting. So, if you all know that there is a Thursday over the next two months that you are not available, it would be useful to know that now because then I won't offer that as a potential date. I 
don't see any for me. Okay, so if, if you come across a Thursday that you know you're not available, just let me know. Okay, um, so I'm gonna do that. The other two things that we need to do is um, selection guidance and interview questions. Um, I would actually love us to take a moment now to think about selection guidance. Um, interview questions will come later because I will solicit questions from the council as I did to the planning board and I will announce that to the council tonight that if they want to send me VBA questions, uh, they should do so. There is another document here that's ZBA selection guidance. If you remember when we did the planning board selection guidance, it was, uh, we ended up making a pretty simple document that had section A that was just copy and pasted from our um, adopted process. We added a four to it, which was characteristics. Um, and then section B, input from the body's chair, we literally just copy and pasted what we got from the chair of planning board. So I have put together selection guidance that is the process for A and B is just copy and pasted uh, what the chair Mark Parent sent me. Um, so my question is for uh, the planning board, we also added an A4, which was um, characteristics that we thought would be useful for a planning board member um, that we came up with as a group during a meeting. Uh, we could, in theory, transfer those over here. And the reason I didn't is because if you remember, we used Mark Parent's list of, of characteristics as our sort of springboard for our ideas of what to include. Um, and because he has given us that same list, I sort of thought uh, it unnecessary, but I would love to have a, a conversation about the selection guidance um, and whether or not we feel as though um, we would want it to be anything more than this. George. I appreciate uh, Mark's uh, doing what he did. I do have some questions about some of these terms <laughs> as to what they mean. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's a big deal for the rest of you. Um, I'm not quite sure what professional means. Um, teacher, not professor, um, could use some elaboration. Others are very clear, I think, to me. I don't know if people want to go through them all or whether they want to just leave it as it is and we'll just, we'll just deal with it in the, in the heat of the moment. But a couple of these, um, at least one or two, I'm a little puzzled as to how to interpret it. Um, it's only one or two, really, I think. Uh, and maybe most of you don't have a problem with it, or it's not a big deal. And then, do we want to add things to this? That's another question. Sarah. So when I originally talked to Mark Parent, um, when he said teacher, not professor, it was because he believed that professors tend to um, pontificate and um, sometimes they're rigid in their views. So he was thinking more a teacher than a professor. Yeah. So no you can take that there. where you would like right. to take that. Um, <laughs> and professional, I think he, when he said professional to me, and, and of course Evan can say something different if he got something different from Mark when he talked to him. I didn't talk to him. I, oh, you didn't? Oh, I emailed him said, and he literally said, this is what I sent Sarah. Yeah, and <laughs> so he, um, I think that when he was talking about professional in that sense, I believe he meant it as far as someone who is civil, someone who is mature, and someone who is willing to get work done. Okay. That was useful. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. Uh, Darcy. Um. <coughs> So this is the list of selection guidance criteria um, that we're using, this bulleted list. This, uh, this is from the chair. No, I understand that, but I don't see anything other than that, um, other than we have a strong base of season members, newer members. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I just have a little trouble with this bulleted list because it seems a little random. Um, 
and um, you know, like unbiased and no agenda seem to be the same thing. And um, I think it's helpful to get the input from the chair, but I think that um, it's always, uh, you know, it, if the current members of the planning board or the ZBA or whichever group um, have a monolithic opinion about how things should go and they don't want other people coming on who have an, an agenda, I'm not sure what that means. Um, and so I guess, you know, we had talked about that we would, that we would consider having a criteria of um, whether the applicant offers a voice that's underrepresented on the body. Um, and so we never, we have never discussed it. And that of course is different from saying unbiased and no agenda. Um, you don't want to say the person has an agenda, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, th that there's something to be said for having a diversity of voices on all of these different boards. Um, it's hard to, it's tricky because it's hard to sort that out in an interview process, but um, I'm just saying that, you know, you, do, you don't want all one opinion on any of these bodies. So, so I just wanna frame this discussion. So when we did the planning board selection guidance, and just because we did it for that doesn't mean we have to do it for this, but our, our idea was for B, input from the body's chair, we were gonna put in whatever the body's chair told us. We weren't gonna edit it, we weren't gonna select it. So, so that section is done. And I, and I agree that at some, it feels a bit random, and I, I, I shared some of George's confusion about some of these things, and I appreciate Sarah's sure. clarification of Mark Parent's clearly anti-professor bias. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so that section's done. And so the real, the real question for this body, I think first, and, and I think that's where this discussion lies, is for the planning board, we did have an A4, which we labeled characteristics of a successful planning board member. And we put some of the things that we as a group generated that was an addition to B. And so um, my point earlier was that we used B, what, what this list actually to inform that. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, do we feel like we need an A4 our generated list of characteristics of an effective planning board member, which would get at sort of, I think, Darcy's uh, um, wanting of having uh, something about diverse perspectives, that would go under an A4. And so um, I think that's the, that's the first place we have to have this discussion is, do we as a group, and, and, and I think the Darcy's answer is clearly yes on this, do we as a group feel as though there are more characteristics or qualifications that are not in this list under B that we want included in selection guidance that would therefore be an A4. So that, that, that is, I think, the first question. Before we get to what those were, what those might be, do we feel as though there are qualifications not captured in the list in B that we want to make sure are in selection guidance that would have to be captured in A4? Do we have that somewhere that we can look at, our former? The planning board selection guidance? I will add it to the packet. It's, it should be the final report to the town council. Not um, because I have ever Does that have the interview okay. questions? That has the most things. That was. Rather than picking it out as a specific thing. So when would, did we do? You want, you want the report? Yeah, I want the report because okay. that includes the questions too. Okay, if you, and if in fact, the questions I was going to suggest later that when you offer to the town council tonight that they should send you the questions, they should not send you random questions. They should look at the questions we asked of the planning board candidates and they should elaborate on those, not make them up out of their heads. And they would need that reminder as well. Okay. Let me make sure that I just uploaded a report. Let me just check real quick and make sure it is the correct report. Uh, it appears that it,
I, I don't know why I don't have that full report in my folder labeled reports on my computer. So I am honestly just going to upload the selection guide and send you your questions first. No, I, I, I have a Word document that doesn't include the attachments, and I know the PDF has the attachments, and it's for some reason not in the folder on my computer that it should be in. So I, I have, at least for right now, added the planning board selection guidance and planning board interview questions to this packet. So if we look, there is an, uh, so it, for some reason in the planning board we did, it's 1D instead of A4, consistency. Um, and we added four characteristics which were open-minded, able to work in a collaborative spirit, openness to compromise, and understanding of the regulatory body. I have just uploaded it to the packet, yes. So I think when I, and I, I guess the reason I had a question about whether we wanted to add it is when I'm looking at what we did for planning board, open-minded, able to work in a collaborative spirit, openness to compromise, understanding of the regulatory function of the body, I felt as though those aren't necessarily said directly from Mark Parent, but in many ways, um, and he did say he must understand the judicial nature of the position, which is, which is again important here. Uh, he did say negotiating skills and mediation conflict regu resolution, and so I felt like a lot of those things were captured in his list. And so the question was, <coughs> did we feel, even though he didn't use the words that we used for planning board, and I think some of those are transfer over, you know, open-minded, unbiased, no agenda, I feel like these are synonymous in a lot of ways. And so the question was, given that so much of what was in our list for planning board kind of came from his list, do we feel like we need our own list that would be an A4 or a 1D, however I, or a, I may use. So, thoughts, Darcy. Um, yeah, I, I immediately, you know, as I was looking at it, I, it was confusing to me because it doesn't make sense to me to have the criteria listed under uh, the input from the body's chair um, as ruling what we decide, which, I mean, it's a good input, but it's just input. And so for us not to actually have our own characteristics seems like, you know, okay. a problem. George. Well, I'm struggling to come up with ones uh, that are different from the list. The uh, one that I have in front of me is evidence of a record of hard work, which could also be simply committed. I think one of the things that I'm looking for in any applicant is some evidence or record that they've actually worked hard on something. Um, one of the senses I get from this body in particular, but probably applicable to many of the, of the bodies that, uh, that the town has volunteers serving on, is uh, the fact that people are willing, I mean, what Mark calls committed, um, but particularly with this EBA, um, this is a, a demanding a job. And so I'm looking for uh, evidence in someone's record that they've had a demanding job, or they've put in uh, time um, that really required a sacrifice of, of, of their time and that they stuck to it. Um, that to me is very important. Um, but you could call that committed, I guess. Um, otherwise, I guess I'm struggling for what else we would add to this, and I, I'm quite open to suggestions, but um, evidence of record of collaboration, I think that's in, in, in his list as well. Um, I think it's very important that um, we stress the judi judicial nature of this position that um, they're not making bylaws, they interpret and apply them. Um, I guess here I do not agree. I, I think I'm more open to a discussion about viewpoints or whatever that's supposed to mean with the planning board, but with the zoning board, I would strongly resist any idea of trying to find disparate viewpoints. Um, it's kind of like in baseball, um, you know, you want an umpire who has a certain idea of maybe changing the game. Um, there are rules here and you need to apply them and you need to respect them whether you like them or not. And I guess I'd also be looking, but this is hard to phrase, 
um, experience or, or some kind of you know, anecdote where someone could tell me where they had to apply a rule uh, that they personally didn't agree with. Um, because that's really what sometimes you have to do on the CBA. Um, planning board, I think, is a different, somewhat different animal, but that's for another discussion. So I guess my question to my colleagues is, well, what else do you want to add to this? Um, that, uh, because I hear what Darcy's saying, uh, we're pretty much taking what Mark has, but he's pretty much covered the waterfront as far as I can see, but I, I, it's just my two eyes, so maybe I'm missing something important. Um, what's missing in this list? Sarah. So I understand what Darcy's saying about trying to make sure that we have people from that have diverse viewpoints, but I, I think that I would keep things the way they are because I, I think that, I know that what Mark Parent was saying was, and, and I tend to agree with this, and I think I've said this on many occasions, is that we all have our own ideas about how things should be run. We have our own ideas about what values are, um, and we bring all of that rich tapestry to the work that we do, but I don't know that, I don't think that I want to have someone who, from when I hear agenda, I hear, to me, that means rigidity. That means that you know that that person is going to come down on one side of an argument the same way all the time, which maybe is exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> um, you know they're always going to come down the same way. And I think it also makes people think that someone might not have their ears open or they might not be open to what someone else is saying, which is challenging. I, I struggle with it. Um, but I don't know that I would want to have, I, I'm, I worry about the diversity of trying to put that in there because I, diversity of ideas sometimes, again, I feel like it might be asking for an agenda and I don't think I want that. Alyssa. So I got a little lost while I was uploading the whole report, but it, um, it's my understanding that where we are right now is we are talking about our selection guidance. And so Correct. if we're looking at the plan, our report uh, to the town council and planning board, oh God, page numbers, you know. But um, anyway, it's planning board selection guidance adopted January 8th. It has the criteria, as we've talked about a million times, um, for effective, healthy multiple member body. It has, as you said, that section D that we based on conversations we'd had that say open-minded, able to work, collaborative spirit, openness to compromise. That included B, that included item two, the input from the body's chair. So like you said, the input from the body's chair part, unedited, right? right. That just goes in the way it says. So the only piece we're missing is the middle piece, right? We have, we know what our healthy multiple member body piece is, we know what the chair's input is, and we're just deciding now if D, if I'm understanding this correctly, we're just deciding if the D that's currently in that report to the town council, characteristics of effective planning board members, can just be switched to characteristics of effective ZBA members, open-minded, able to work in a collaborative spirit, openness to compromise, understanding of the regulatory function of the body is sufficient or if it needs to have something added to it. Or, or if we even need it in the ZBA. Well, we need it because we can't just have our generic theory about, about term limits or not and our really generic <laughs> random bullet points um, from the chair, which aren't, you know, which is fine. I mean, I mean, I don't, and I'm really grateful that he went ahead and gave it to us, but I think we still have to come up with, we have to decide if we want D or if we want something else, but I don't think we flush it all together because then it's not selection criteria right. anymore. And so I guess my, que my, my question was, okay, so let, I wanna do this in two stages then. I'm gonna do this in two stages then. Um, and because my question was looking at that, it seemed like that is, it, although in different words, captured in what we got from Mark Perrin. Yes. And so the question was if that's what we, if, that, if we would come up with those same things for ZBA, do we even need to add it if it's somewhat duplicative of what Mark Perrin said? So here, here's the first question, and, and I'm hoping we can do this by consensus, is do we want in what would, for this document, be an A4, characteristics of a, an effective planning of it, sorry. Do we want an A4, characteristics of effective zoning board of appeals members 
which would add characteristics to supplement the list at Mark Paramount. That's the first question. Do we want to have that section in the VBA selection guidance like we did in the planning board selection yeah. guidance? Okay, so great, that was easy. So the question is, what do we put there? And so the first, the first question is, do we want to carry over what's in the planning board selection guidance into the ZBA selection guidance? Let's start, before we talk about additions, right. let's start there. Do we want to carry over what's in planning board selection guidance? Yeah. Okay, George? It may not be really relevant, but uh, Mark uses judicial, we use regulatory, does that matter? I might say understanding of the judicial function of the body, stealing from Mark's comment, but maybe regulatory is good enough. Uh, Scott? Judicial? Yeah, I, I, would, I would suggest that as a possible slight change, but otherwise those four, I'm perfectly uh, willing to accept them, and, um, but I might suggest changing regulatory to judicial. There's consensus on carrying them over except changing regulatory to judicial. Okay, I'm not hearing any opposition and I'm seeing some head nods. If you will please. Is it completely judicial? I guess yeah. it is, huh? It's in a judicial. Okay, control. all right. Yeah. Um, okay, if you'll just give me literally a second, just copy and paste that in. Okay, so making progress. So the next question then is, do we want any additions to this? Darcy. I would just say that 1B um, sort of attempts to cover what I was suggesting with regard to new members. I'm, I'm sorry, what? 1B, these members bring new energy outlooks and ideas to the body. You're talking, okay. So, so we have to, we have we're looking at a healthy multiple member body. One, I'm, I, what I'm doing is I'm, <laughs> trying to figure out where in this could be included the idea that a diversity of voices is healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and so this does already say these members bring new energy outlooks and ideas to the body. Um, I think that might be Sarah's language. Um, um, yes. But... Um, So that is, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out whether that, that is adequate for covering, maybe we could just say voices, bring new energy voices and ideas to the body. Um, and that obviously the new members are the ones that we're interviewing for new seats. Well, I'm trying to understand, is 1B, this is the planning board document that I'm looking at at the moment. Right. The Same in the other? The, the numbering's different. I just fixed the numbering in the Zoning oh. Board of Appeals document. But that, that, that item is there in the ZBA as well, is yes. that correct? So it's already there. Yes. Um, so I think what we were trying to talk about was 1D, um, 1B, at least in the planning document, is in the ZBA document. Yep. I think that can be interpreted a lot of different ways, but that's okay. Um, it's there. And uh, it's really the question about 1B, uh, D, is there anything else you want to add, um, anyone wants to add, to characteristics of effective ZBA board member beyond the four items that are listed there? And we've changed regulatory to judicial, but that's it. And so the question, I think, in front of us is, what do we want to do with 1 D, do we want to add anything else? Alyssa. 
So I think what I'm hearing is that while we are currently focused on what George just said and what I thought I'd said, which was that we're focused on are we how much of D are we changing from planning board to ZBA Correct. beyond the word and the regulatory word, and Darcy is suggesting that another way to approach it is rather than trying to say it's a particular characteristic of effective ZBA members, she's wondering if there's a way to change the section A through C to make clear that we are what she is looking for so that it would apply to like any time. You know, it's like our the A through C are like our basic selection criteria. D is our based on this specific body. And so you're it sounds like you're asking that it be incorporated into our basic selection criteria for anybody as opposed to it being particularly important for ZBA. Well, of course there's really only ZBA <laughs> planning board and finance committee. But so that's just two different approaches. One is to make sure it's covered in some fashion in D. The other is to make sure it's com covered in some fac fashion in, I guess it would have to be A, right? And because A or B. We're hearing from some people that these members bring new energy outlooks and ideas to the body and that that may or may not be sufficient to address this particular issue. I think that was part of our intention of writing it that way originally, was trying to address that. And so if rereading that, it still doesn't feel sufficient, then I guess we need either suggested wording to change B or to add an additional item to D. Correct. Okay. Well stated, Alyssa. <laughs> and so. Um, I, I um, would like to, as George said, you know, that that sentence is capable of a number of different interpretations. So, um, but, uh, and I like the word voice. Um, so if we could change, we, we could either add to D a five that says, a diversity of outlooks or voices, but that's difficult with the ZBA, I understand. Um, or we could put it in B and just say, these members bring new, uh, new, or new members will bring new energy, new voices and ideas to the body or whatever, something like that. Um, is anyone else interested in doing this? George. I'm just imagining how I might interpret B um, in an actual case. And for instance, if we're looking at a body where everybody's you know, 65 or older, um, I might give some greater preference to a, a younger member. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, at least in the moment, we don't seem to have a diversity of gender. Um, also, you might um, consider um, you know, a, a renter or a uh, someone of you know so I mean there are ways of looking at this that um, well not, I'm not sure exactly um, because there's also the suggestion that you're looking for uh, someone who has a different view on development or a different view on where they think Amherst should go or a different view on da 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 and that's when I get very um, nervous um, so again my understanding of B uh, would I would apply it in those ways. Um, providing a new perspective, new energy, and new ideas in that sense, um, I would be very, very reluctant to apply it, nor would I apply it in the sense of, well, gee, we don't have anybody on the zoning board who thinks that we shouldn't have any new more buildings, or we shouldn't have any more development, or doesn't like uh, One East Pleasant, or whatever. Um, that's when I get um, testy. Even though a huge number of people in town have that view? I don't think that's the job of the zoning board. And until somebody changes the zoning board job description, I'm going to maintain that position. It's not the job of the zoning board um, to, uh, to, Im to uh, make decisions as to that regard. Their job is to interpret um, the, uh, the zoning laws in a fair and impartial way to the best of their ability. Everyone does bring their perspective. Everybody does bring their background. There's no question of that. But I'm looking for someone um, who is able to be balanced and fair and does not have an agenda about how tall buildings are, how short they are, how ugly they are, or anything else. 
Um, and if someone's looking for that kind of person on this body, I would speak strongly against it. But so aren't, I, aren't you looking for someone with your agenda, George? Huh? I'm, I'm just asking for someone who doesn't have a view on that and would not let their view on that um, dis determine their decision uh, in front of the CPA. So that's how I interpret B. I do think it allows for um, obviously different ways of thinking about it, and which I think perhaps would include, um, well, I'll leave it at that. And that's how I would apply it in my own mind. Um, how, that's how I would apply B. And also how I would not apply it. Alyssa. So in agreeing with George and adding a little more to it in that I don't believe any of us knows what the alleged agenda or bias of the seated ZBA and planning board members are. I believe that because they don't run for office like we do, they didn't talk about zoning moratoriums, building moratoriums, et cetera, during their campaign for elected office. They wished to be appointed to an office where they said they could work within the constraints. Planning board is a little different because although they do some special permitting where they have to do that adjustment, they also are looking at the bigger picture in terms of the master plan and saying, you know, given what everybody's been talking about, given the master plan we have, given what's recently happened downtown, maybe we should change some of our zoning bylaws. And then they bring that to the town council. And the town council says, yeah, given where we're headed as a town, thank you for doing that, or no, you guys are nuts. <laughs> um, ZBA doesn't have that, that ability to bring forward new ideas as to what the zoning bylaw should look like. That's not their task, that's the planning board's task. So if someone is trying to get appointed to the zoning board of appeals to make judicial decisions on special permits, they should not be bringing the attitude of, I hate the building downtown. That's not helpful for them to make a fair and balanced decision. The fact that permitting has occurred doesn't mean that some of the people who voted for it didn't like it. Like, you don't have to personally like the way the building looks to have felt like, in order to apply the law fairly, I have to make X, Y, Z decision. And so, the fact that permitting has occurred does not mean that the current body has an agenda, quote unquote, toward building downtown, density downtown, or not. It's that they are, to the best of their ability, applying what they think is fair. Would you want like five members of the same family who agree on everything to make the ZBA decisions? Probably not, because then they probably do look at things more similarly, although we all know about siblings and differences. But as long as you're not just leaving it up to one person, you are getting a diversity of opinion that says, given the law we have, given the personal biases I bring to this, but given the law we have, here's how I need to vote. That feels very different to me than saying it should be, we should have some people on there who don't like the direction of downtown development. We should have some people on there who would have voted against, it. like, what? Like, that's not why we're choosing people. That's what elections are for. And that's not so that we can, as counselors, load it up with our proxies. It's because we're looking for people who are there to do a job. We don't own them just because we appoint them. Okay, uh, so uh, stepping stepping a little bit out of my, my chair role to add my, my comment on this, I think I agree with a lot of what Alyssa said. I guess my concern is this mm -hmm. idea of trying to put people into these particular political boxes on an issue, which I think could be important. And so, you know, if we wanna think about, you know, um, planning board, we had three candidates who probably have three different viewpoints on, on, on every issue. And so trying to divide them between two types of groups of people seems um, not super effective. I think that there are, you know, if we're looking even at this body, there are a lot of issues that Alyssa and I agree on a lot. Um, I'm also bracing her for her to vote against my bylaw amendment tonight, right? Because there are issues that we also disagree on. And so I, I worry about this simplistic, we need people who are pro-development or anti-development um, and, and, and Darcy, that is what you said 
in our meeting after the interview, you said there are two camps of people. There are people who want unfettered development and there are people who want fettered development. Um, I think that's a direct quote. And, and, and I, I'm wary of trying to insert that sort of simple um, boxing of people or compartmentalizing of people and trying to put that into any type of policy or selection guidance. Because um, I don't necessarily think it's productive and I don't necessarily think that it actually represents the people, the idea that everyone is different and has different feelings about different issues in different ways. Um, and I'm also really concerned, it always makes me really uncomfortable trying to use the language of diversity around that. Because um, when I think about diversity, I think about protected classes, right? And I think about we need gender diversity, we need uh, racial diversity, I think about all of these things. And when we basically say this group of older white men is diverse because they have different views on buildings of downtown, I, I think it sort of perverts what we typically think about with diversity. Um, and so I, I, I would personally like to try to take that idea of political opinions out of these bodies. If there is consensus to put it into these bodies, I would really like us to avoid lumping it in with our statement about diversity around gender, race, and age, because I think that that um, would be personally offensive to me, and I think would be to a lot of people. I think that would be a completely separate category. Um, so I think there's two things there. I don't really wanna see it in here at all, but if it is in there, I would really encourage us to not try to lump it into our bullet point about looking for diversity of gender, age, race, and then political opinions. I think that that undercuts the other aspects of demographic diversity that we're actually looking for. Um, so where do we stand with this? We have a document um, and the question is, do we want to add to 1D? We have four things under 1D, open-minded, able to work in a collaborative sphere, openness to compromise and understanding of the judicial function of the body. Do we want to add to that list? Alyssa. So the, the reason I feel like it's enough to have B right now, newer members, blah, 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 new energy outlooks and ideas to the body. The point of selection criteria, because I've been having this conversation associated with school committee vacancy, the point of selection criteria is so that we can sit here as a group and talk about why we prefer one candidate over another without saying, Bill wore a funny hat. I didn't like what he said about X. Instead, we say, we said that we were interested in new energy and outlooks. And I'm hearing a lot about a new outlook from candidate B. And that's why I am looking to vote for candidate B. I'm, in, I'm really interested in that idea of a new energy and outlook. Otherwise, we may as well just ask people to tell us why they hate something or why they don't. Because, and, and yet, Several of us disagree that that is an appropriate role for this body. So I think it's perfectly justifiable for anybody who feels like there's not enough diversity of opinion, I'm using that word diversity inappropriately, um, that they can say that person and persons, I hope we all want people with new ideas, can sit here and say, I'm really excited to hear this new v way of looking at things. I've never heard anybody from the ZBA talk about that, be that way before. I think that will be a really valuable addition to the way the ZBA is working. I think that's incredibly helpful. I think that trying to define it as some sort of agenda, not agenda, bias, not bias, just doesn't really work. But I hope we will, we, like we didn't just write these words for fun. Like we wrote these because we want to be able to use them. So at this point then, I am looking for one of two things. I am looking for someone to propose an addition to this list, or I am looking for someone to move that we adopt the Zoning Board of Appeals selection guidance as amended. And to let you know, the only things that have changed from the document you have in your packet is the addition of D, characteristics of effective Zoning Board of Appeals members, which has one, open-minded, two, able to work in a collaborative spirit, three, openness to compromise, and four, understanding of the judicial function of the body. And I have uh, renumbered lettered 
the document so that it is consistent with the lettering and numbering of the planning board document. So it's now 1D as opposed to A4. Um, but those are the only changes that have been made. So I'm either looking for a motion to adopt or I am looking for someone to put forth something they would like to add to this document. George? I'm willing to make a motion to adopt um, the criteria for zoning board. Zoning board of appeal selection. Appeal guidance. selection guidance. Thank you. Um, as amended. George has moved. Is there a second? Sarah has seconded. Is there any further discussion or any proposed amendments to this document? Alyssa. Just to clarify, so when we're looking at that whole thing from the from the planning board. That's just all been up, like it says, adopted 1-8. It's basically that whole structure, like you said, because you've renumbered it, and then it has that wording change, and it has the input from the body's chair. It's this whole thing. It's not just D that we're changing. It's that this is now our new document, Zoning Board of Appeals Selection Guidance, adopted 3-9. Right. Yes, Correct. and it includes all those components. Correct. That's what I'm making Correct. sure, that that component of outlooks and ideas is still in there. Okay. Any further comments or amendments to this document before we vote? Okay, then I will call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Okay, I am going to give us a five minute break and then we will come back and move to the next agenda item. Anybody said to start with that one. Okay, so we are back and Darcy, you had a question. I just have a question that's off the agenda about, uh, because I was looking for our minutes <laughs> and I yes. couldn't find any back going back to September, either draft or in any form, so. So we are way behind on minutes. Um, if you remember at some point in uh, late summer, I believe, um, we shift, when we got the minute taker, so I guess maybe that was September, we shifted um, how we did approval of minutes to uh, delegating it to the chair. And honestly, I have had on my to-do list OCA minutes, and it's one of those items that I keep pushing off as I have to do other things. Um, and so we are way behind on minutes. Uh, as, as you are probably aware, I have spring break coming up, and I am not going anywhere uh, because don't want to get coronavirus. Um, <laughs> and so uh, one of the things that I have put on my spring break to-do list is catch up on all of the minutes. And so um, they should be up by mid-March. So I apologize, it, that's on me, and it's just I have been so at capacity with work, uh, and that's been an easy thing to just say, okay, this doesn't need to be done today. So. Maybe, we, maybe we should just have minutes the regular way coming to us during our meetings, because I'd like to actually see the minutes on a regular basis. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any interest in that? We can do that. No? I, I'm, I'm fighting apathy this week, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna argue with someone taking work off my plate, so. I would just say that it might be easier for you, and I hate to see you have spring break and then have to just be all those minutes, oh, well, right? No. <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to approve all of the minutes going back to September, um, but I mean, I'm talking going forward um, to, you know, for our short life until June 30th. So is that is that the proposal then that he can deal with the backlog however he chooses, and then from starting today after Athena gets them ready and she sends them to him, and he can say, yeah, go ahead and send them to the rest of OCA, and then we'll approve them yeah, here. Okay. George. My custom is just to put it in the packet so that um, you have the minutes to look at before the meeting. So that's another way you can do it. Yeah, uh, as long as it shows up in SharePoint, yeah, good, right? Yeah, I put right? it in the SharePoint packet, and then I assume people look at it, and then we just uh, do it by consensus or whatever the chair wants to do, but okay. we just then it's done. 
So I will, I will work on So our next meeting is after spring break. Um, and so we will be in a better position then. And if we're not, uh, you can yell at me. OK, so I want to move on to agenda item four, which is a continuation of a conversation we had last time, which it was about community activity forms. And so uh, the last time we met, we started talking about what was useful, what was not useful about community activity forms. Um, and we threw out some ideas. And I promised you that I would have for today some mock-ups of what a revised CAF could look like given our discussion. I put two out there that are almost identical except different in one way. And so there seemed to be a split on this committee about whether we wanted to um, separate out questions about experience training qualifications into three separate questions um, or if we wanted to maintain that question but word it in a way so that it would, one, get us away from just listing of qualifications and two, um, not scare anyone away who might feel as though they didn't have those. Uh, I have put two CAFs, so I've put them in your packet. Um, I, some of the wording is mine. I am I am perfectly willing to hear people tell me no. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to do any of this. Or uh, your wording is garbage, Evan. <laughs> so whatever we want to say. But I think that perhaps the conversation that we have had around along the margins and sometimes more directly um, that relates to this is, you know, I keep hearing Alyssa say, well, I can't decide what to put on the CAF until we know what we're going to do with them. And so um, I think it makes sense before we actually go through some of these recommended revisions, uh, I think we do need to have the conversation about uh, whether we are going to recommend to the council um, that CAS remain personnel records and treat it as we have been treating them, or whether or not we are going to recommend we shift CAS to be public documents. Because the answer to that question may inform our final recommendation on revisions to the CAFs. And so depending on what conversation, how that conversation happens today, uh, we may not do any of these revisions, or we may want to do more and come back to them. So I will open the floor, Darcy. Um, I just, you probably all noticed that I s sent you an email right at the beginning of the meeting yes. um, with the Northampton language on their C, their equivalent to our CAFs. And in red is the sentence that they add to their form, which basically makes it a public document when the person signs off. So it says important, once this form is submitted, it becomes a public document. If there's information you do not want open to the public, please do not include it on this form. So um, I, I'm hoping that we've all thought about this enough and come around to thinking that um, it makes sense to just, you know, have more transparency and um, just allow the CAFs to be public documents. Alyssa. So, no, I have not come around to that viewpoint. You, I don't believe that the email, which I know was while we were all settling in here and not having Wi-Fi, et cetera, mm -hmm. did you link us to the actual CAF form that Northampton uses? Because if I don't know what's on their form, I don't really care what the disclosure says. I mean, if their form only has a person's name and the committee they're interested in, that's different than a form that has all the questions we have on it, but has a, a thing that says, sure, you can just, well, but I don't see it. I mean, I haven't been provided that. If this is such an important thing to do, then we should be looking at what the rest of their context is for that. Just, can I just, so if you, if you could, given, given that, could you uh, put the link, could you put it in the packet, a link to it? Or download it and put Either download it and put it in the packet, or you can, you can upload a URL to the packet too. But, um, either way, just so it's in the packet. Right there. <laughs> I always forget how to do the upload URL part, but I'm it's sure just, Evan will tell us again. It's, yeah, you just do. Um, new link. Okay, so sorry to interrupt. Oh, just, I mean, we should go ahead and, and wait for that. But the, the other piece is there, one of the things that's always been a little weird is how much detail we would release, right? So we've had this conversation. Like, so if we, if we put on a checkbox that says we're gonna release this, then we have to decide how much stuff this is, right? right. So, so as you framed so well at the beginning. 
if it just says, my name is Paul Smith, and I'm interested in the ZBA, that's one kind of CAF to release. Paul Smith applied to the ZBA. And maybe there's 25 Paul Smiths in town. Who knows? So that's transparency theater. That's not transparency. That's just a person's name. Who cares? We don't even know if they live in Amherst. If you're going to include their address, for example, because they need to be an Amherst resident, not a registered voter in these cases, but a, a resident, if you want people to look people up because you want to be transparent, then they have to release their address to us because that's how we know which Paul Smith it is. Are you going to tell Paul Smith, who doesn't want his address published on the town website, that he can't apply? Well, or we're going to just say Paul Smith's name, but not where he lives, but the other people that will have where they live? See, that's why I'm saying this is transparency theater. This is not actually accomplishing anything in terms of transparency. It's just giving out pieces of data that have no context. So I, I do want to add, um, I don't know that I have a firm opinion on this necessarily, and I think that um, I, I take Alyssa's point as it's also not an all or nothing. You release a full CAF or you release nothing. Um, so there's lots of nuance here. Um, but when it comes to the idea of transparency, I do want to return back to a conversation we had very uh, early, uh, er earlier on in the existence of this body, which was about balancing uh, transparency and privacy interests um, and protecting privacy interests so that people won't be um, scared off of applying for bodies. And I will say that I have spent the past month, month and a half, asking pretty much anyone who I think is reasonable and has a pulse whether or not they want to be on the ZBA, whether they'd be willing to serve. I have worked really hard to recruit people to the ZBA. And um, the most recent conversation I had with a person who did not end up applying, this person is not in the pool, they said, well, first they said, well, what is the ZBA? And then I explained to them, and they said, oh, OK, because they, they didn't necessarily want to do stuff, the zoning stuff that the planning board does. They didn't want to create new zoning bylaws. And they said, oh, that actually sounds interesting. And then they said, would I have to, this is a direct quote, would I have to go through that whole dog and pony show that you made planning board members go through? And I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, those public interviews on camera. And I said, that's part of the process. The ZVA members will be interviewed. And they said, never mind then. And I said, well, why not? And they said, I don't want to have video of me interviewing for a body and then not get it. Um, and so they were actually there to submit a CAF for a ZBA. And I think they would have been good. And they decided against it because they didn't want to do a public interview. Because to them, that was too much. They didn't want to be um, on camera in front of, in front of an audience um, have that out publicly and then not get it, uh, which confirmed a fear that I've had that this opening up the process is good in a lot of ways in that it shows the public more of the interworkings of the council, but there's a potential downside. And we've been talking about it as a hypothetical, um, and this was confirmation that it's not a hypothetical. There are people who are not going to apply for things because they don't want to do public interviews. And so there is the concern, of course, that again, this idea of a public CAF, of everything you submit to us will also be sent to the public in there. And, and what that means can mean different things. It could just be that if someone submits a public records request, they're submitted. I know, Darcy, you've talked in the past about wanting them actually uploaded to the website so literally anyone could go and click on them. Um, and so I want to make sure we understand that dynamic in this conversation, that there are potential downsides to these ideas that we're calling transparency, um, because I think that's important to consider. that. It's, it's not a hypothetical that we might scare people away if we say this is going to be a public document. Um, so I think we need to think about that because I do think, again, there are different levels of what we do with this. It's not all public on the website available or not at all. There's, there's different things in between, and we want to find the way that best represents a level of usable transparency but also ensures that we're not scaring potential new people away um, who are nervous about putting themselves out there. Darcy. I just sent you the form as a link and an email, and I don't think I remember how to put it on SharePoint because I haven't done it since I wrote minutes. Um, 
So. Okay, I will, I will put it on SharePoint. Thank you for doing that, Dustin. Just have to scroll down. George. This is a this isn't an easy one for me and, and that's okay, but when I hear Evan's story, I don't feel a lot of sympathy for this this soul who um, who is going to serve on a body that's going to make important decisions in front of the public and yet they don't want to put their name in the ring because they might be rejected and they don't want anyone to know that. Um, yes, it probably means that some potentially good people might not serve in the ZBA, but uh, surely there are a lot more good people out there. And I, I guess I just don't find that argument very, very convincing. Um, I need something stronger to push me away from the view that I'm finding uh, attractive, which is, look, this is the ZBA, this is the planning board, um, public has a right to know who's applied and, and what they, uh, you know, who they are. Um, beyond just their name, it seems not unreasonable that someone should be able to look at, you know, their, their statement. Um, there is an interview process that's also public, I realize, so that certainly meets some of the concerns of transparency and openness, which is good. And um, I resisted that originally, but I've, I've come around to see that that makes, I think, some good sense. So I guess I'm struggling with why not go all the way. And I, my mind is open here. I really am struggling with this. But I guess I'm leaning at the moment towards a sense of, um, you know, the, the Northampton model may be the way for us to go. Um, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of what are the serious downsides, and I hear this, the, the, the arguments made by a number of my colleagues that some good people will not apply because of this process. Now this individual, Evan, just mentioned that process that, that they objected to, we've already agreed to do. That's not going to change. The public interviews is right. And um, so that's, you know, um, we're not going to go back on that. Um, so maybe it's just a matter of the folks in Amherst getting used to this and us making a stronger case with people who s uh, express these objections. Um, anyway, I, I guess I'm, I'm looking for reasons why we should not make these public in the way that, that Darcy has suggested and in the way that Northampton does it. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm open here, but I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Sarah. So I actually feel in a lot of ways the same way that George does is originally I, I really didn't want to have the CAFs be, you know, take all of these questions and I would make, you know, all of it public. But I think that, I think there's a push for us to, to do that kind of real transparency. And I think that for me, I'm still, I'm still wondering if maybe doing so much of this out in the open and having all of the, you know, have a write a statement and put it out, maybe, I feel like it might be what people want and maybe it will, it could, it could raise the bar on people that we have applied, but at the same time, so I'm willing to, I'm willing to say that let's give this a try, but one thing I would really like to say is that I think that all of these measures that we take I think that there should be somewhere written, like what are possible drawbacks? I mean, we had talked about that, about making the um, interviews mm -hmm. public, is will we have less people apply? Will we suddenly have a dearth of people? And I think that if you kind of look at where we came from, when it was private, we had a lot more people applying. And then when we went public, we had a lot less. But I think we should give I think it should be reviewed, but I think it needs to have a couple, maybe two or three more years of doing it a certain way before we can say it definitely has a negative impact. Alyssa. So I'm following up on the Northampton situation, so I appreciate you going and finding that, Darcy, which basically we copied much of our forms from each other because we used <laughs> similar software. However, I don't see any evidence whatsoever that this becomes a public document upon application. 
When I look at their boards and committee's description, it says after you submit an application, the application goes to the mayor by email. They look at the application. They put it on file for a year. If it exists, it's sent to a staff person. If a vacancy exists, they send that application, meaning that CAF, to a staff person for review. The person might go to a meeting. Then eventually, if the mayor decides this person is worth looking at further, the application is then submitted to the city council, which at this point could well be a protected document, just like we're treating it as a protected document here. It doesn't say that's when it get, it doesn't say here when you apply, it becomes public. It doesn't say when it goes to the city council, it becomes public. What it does say eventually is that a city council meeting, the applications referred to a committee, it never says here anywhere at which point, I, and so unless you know that answer because you've actually talked to someone in Northampton who's familiar with the actual process, I don't know when they do make the information public. And so just telling somebody that their CAF information is going to be public eventually is not actually the same as the transparency of as soon as you apply, there's like some scrolling list on the town website that says who's applied for ZBA for the past two years. Like you hit CAF and boom, it ends up there. You hit CAF, it ends up there. So I need a better understanding of what we're actually trying to accomplish here. Darcy. I will keep looking on the website. I should have found this before this meeting, but uh, I, you know, I have searched on the Northampton website and found the actual applications of people that have applied for boards and committees, and you can read exactly what they put on their, their applications. I don't know exactly at what point they become public, but they're, they're, they, it was available to me to read their applications. Okay, George and Sarah. It says once this form is submitted, it becomes a public document. Now, I would read that as meaning once you click on your computer and send it to the town of Northampton, anyone can access it. Access well, it no. Finding it are two right. Things. Sure. Because all that that means that it could be it would be subject to a public records request. Right. Right. So there's a difference between saying this is a public record subject to a public records request, but it's only it's only given to someone if they actually submit the request versus say they're going to be on the website and anyone who wants to can access it. Okay. And and so I, th I think that's part of it. Sarah, yeah. you had your hand up. Okay. Darcy I'm just telling you that you can search. At, I'm not looking right now to try to find out how, but but it is, doesn't just require a public record request. Darcy, you don't know. Just admit it. You don't know. You found some records of CAFs. Great. You don't know at what point in the process. Was that at the point no, where I they don't were know voting? What was that at point the point they the were process? voting? So was it at the point of the they were voting? Is it the point they applied? Is it the point that it was referred to a committee? All that matters to me in terms of content. So that's why I can't believe that after we've talked about this for a year that you don't know the answer to that question just because you found some CAFs online at some point in the process. It's important to me to understand if it's a scrolling thing, if it's when it gets referred to the committee like it goes to their equivalent of GOL, is it when it's in the full town council packet, like you know how we have our report to the full town council, are they in there then? Like, when is it public? Because I, for one, for example, would hope that no one would think it was a wonderful idea to leave a scrolling list of the last two years' worth of CAFs just up because mm -hmm. they turned them in and some of those people have moved away versus here's the pool mm -hmm. at some decision point, which I think is what we've talked about in the past, mm -hmm. more like some counselors have wished that it would be public at the point it came to OCA. Some wish it would be public at the point it comes to town council as opposed to just our report. So, but since even though this has been talked about for a year, it's, we still don't know what we're basing the proposal on except some Google results. I'm uncomfortable with, because they may have, they may have had an experience that helped inform their decision, right? Just like we're talking about collecting data. And the other part is they ask for demographic data. So they ask you to, dis to, to talk about your race and age. And so then you don't fill it out because you don't want that to be public. 
well then what good is the question if you don't want it to be public? And who's more likely to fill it out? White people. I mean, it's just, I, I don't get the point. So it's clear that the Northampton application is a public document. We just don't know right. what that necessarily yeah. means, right? And so again, that could inform our discussion because there is a difference between saying this is subject to a public records request or proactively posting it on the website or something like that. Um, it, it seems like it's possible that there is a public record that you could get through a public records request but doesn't actually be released to the public necessarily until that person is up for appointment. So I think Alyssa's, the Alyssa's point that I'm hearing is that's an important distinction to make and if we're using Northampton as an example or a model, we need clarification on that. Is that a sense, that, that need for clarification or desire of clarification, a sense that other members of this committee have? I'm seeing yes from Sarah. George? I, I guess what I'm, s even if Northampton, it turns out that Northampton's uh, CAF becomes available like within a week of the time that you submit it. Um, why should that, I mean, I'm not sure that's a reason for me to adopt that process. Um, I'm open, I'm, I'm, I understand the idea of transparency and openness, but the question that's coming to my mind more clearly, and we've talked about this, and is that at what point does this become public? And I can see a strong argument for waiting until a certain point in the process that we would have to determine, which might be the time of interviews. But at that point, clearly, these documents should be made public. But why should they be made? And maybe I need an arg argument from the other side now. Why do we need to have them public from the very moment or close to the very moment that, that you hit the, the, the submit button and it goes to the, to the to town? Um, uh, wouldn't that? Delaying that a bit would, might address some of the concerns that Alyssa's expressed, and maybe she would say no, it still doesn't, but in terms of encouraging people to be more forthright about their answers, since they would be, it would be made clear to them this would only become public once they enter the interview, or you know, however we'd phrase it, but um, that to me strikes as a compromise that, that might be workable. Um, and even if it turned out Northampton did make them public from you know, within a week of the time that you submit them, that by itself wouldn't really move me very much one way or the other. It's more the, you know, the, why does that make sense? Um, and maybe Darcy had thoughts on that, but I, I'm struggling to see why it has to be public right from the get-go. Um, and for two years or, you know, I mean, just at what point do you, right. Darcy. Well, for one thing, the public obviously has an interest in these town council bodies that uh, we're talking about here. Um, and I think that were we to add that sentence to the CAF form, um, then it would be up to us to decide how we're going to interpret it. Um, it would be, you know, Northampton and Amherst might do things differently, but, but it doesn't you know, it would, we could still add the sentence and then figure out what it meant at a later time. Um, so it would just open it up to some way of doing it. Um, so anyway, I'm glad to hear that there are some of us that are thinking in these terms now. Okay. So, um, we're starting to run a little short on time. I, I don't think we can make a decision on this today, given the discussion we've had. I'm, al I'm also personally really hesitant to ever to, to add that sentence and say, we'll figure out later, because of course, that means if someone, if we put that sentence on today and someone emails me tomorrow and says, I saw the sentence, how is it released publicly? And I say, eh, we're not sure yet. That's, that's an uncomfortable yeah. position for, you're right. Yeah. Eh, you know, given how we work, eh, well, six months we'll let you know how we're gonna do that. So I, I don't think we can put that sentence on until we know how it's gonna, until we have a recommendation of how it's gonna be implemented. So 
I, this is a conversation I think that needs to be continued, um, which means we're not going to get to look at the actual revisions to the CAS. H here's what I'm going to ask. Since it seems that we're using Northampton to some extent to inform this discussion, and since there are outstanding questions, and since we have actually a fairly significant amount of time before our next meeting, I think our next meeting is like March 30th or something, um, Darcy, if you would be willing to take on a little bit of homework, if you could reach out to um, Northampton and just answer some of these questions that we have about what does that sentence mean, when are they released, are they on the website, how do they decide, if they are on the website, how do they decide when they go on the website, which ones go on the website, um, I think that would be really useful. Sure, I would be glad to do that. Thank you. Um, great, so I think that would be really useful. Um, and if anyone else wants to check in on any other town committee, feel free. Yes, Darcy. Um, and I do have a question. Um, what we're doing now is obviously not applying to the, the, the ZBA applications. Um, are we going to recommend that the full council ratify or take, you know, adopt this process that we're working on right now? About the CAS? I don't think that this body has the ability to unilaterally change CAS. So I think that um, whatever we come up with with regard to CAS will be a recommendation to the council in the same way that we made a recommendation to the council to split out the CAS, and that was then voted on by the council. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're, all we're doing right now is developing a recommendation. Um, great, so we'll hopefully have that information for the 30th, and we'll start with this conversation on the 30th. Um, with the goal of figuring out if and how public um, CAFs might be, and then that will help us uh, think about any potential revisions to the content um, that we're going to recommend. So think about, I mean, we've obviously had a good discussion. Think about that between now and the next meeting, um, and also look at the, the mock-ups and think about both which of those you prefer, if either, you could say I hate them both, um, and also um, think about them in the context of would your opinion on those revisions change depending on the result of a conversation of public disclosure, level of public disclosure. Uh, Alyssa, you had something? Two things. One is, yes, to me it absolutely would change what I wanted to have on the CAF based on when, at what point in the right. process it was getting disclosed. And also why I would like, I would have thought we would know this information already, but since Northampton's being held up as a model, what they're actually doing with that demographic information when if they're treating it as a public record at some point, someone's identification of white is showing up on a public record. And so are they gather? I mean, does anybody answer? My question is, does anybody answer it? And what do they do with that data? Because, you know, we're, we're doing it all in a more anonymized way, just like and the town manager is doing it in a more anonymized way. Um, and so I think that's, because I, per, as I talked about before, when we moved up, and I appreciated that you did that on the draft, that we moved up the statement about our definition of diversity and what we were looking for, I don't like having those demographic questions if they're not going to be answered anyway. And if we're telling people that it's going to be public, it's even less likely they're going to answer them. So then I just would scrap those questions altogether because we're trying to get at the data another way, which is bringing me back to the writing prompt idea. I realized that the third, the third version of the CAF that I should perhaps write myself is that it would have the ad part about the address, which again, not everybody's going to want on the internet, is, the, um, is more of a writing prompt that answers the same questions you got in little boxes, mm -hmm. but that that's what's getting released. It's this writing sample, writing prompt. It's, it, this, is, this is my, well, and we're talking about it right now for uh, school committee. It's a statement of interest. So a statement of interest to me could technically be far more valuable than what looks like little data boxes on an Excel spreadsheet that's actually not data. So um, the demographic stuff sort of is data, but telling me your experiences, that's not very useful in an Excel sort of sort, but it could be useful as a writing sample, and I have no problem at all with having people have to submit a statement of interest as part of their CAF, as opposed to trying to wordsmith our questions perfectly on the CAF. So I, I'm hoping we can consider that as a third option. So, so for the meeting on the 30th, I will also then bring in CAF 
uh, revision option C. Yeah. Um, so for us to look at, Sarah. I also just came up with something that maybe be a revision to how we ask some of those statement okay. of interest questions. So do you want me just to send that to you? That would be great because if you just tell yep. me right now, I promise I'll forget. Yeah. So Don't worry about <laughs> it. I promise. Um, okay, great. So we will continue this discussion. This will be our. Um, this will not be our first agenda item on the 30th because our first agenda item will very likely be um, whatever happens between now and then with the ZBA. Um, and <laughs> is it about CAS? No, it's about okay, CAS. so great. So so future agenda items. So uh, well, actually, let's maybe uh, our agenda. You've noticed I didn't submit a written report to the council for tonight. I, I did not feel like we had anything necessarily to report. Um, that would merit making counselors read anymore. Um, but I will report tonight to the council um, that we have declared the applicant pool sufficient for the ZBA yep. and that we have adopted the selection guidance. Yep. I will also send these things out to them and I will be asking the counselors to submit questions in the same way that they did for the planning board. Um, and I will ask them by a certain date so that I have time to compile them for our next meeting. Um, and so our primary agenda item for next meeting will be, hopefully we will have an interview date um, and we will have a compilation of, count of counselor submitted questions. And so our primary agenda item for the 30th will be to develop interview questions for ZBA. Our secondary agenda item will be to continue this conversation about um, public disclosure of CAS and relatedly potential revisions to the CAS. Alyssa, you wanna make sure I don't forget? Um, when soliciting questions, well, two things. One is, the one is soliciting questions from the full town council to send, resend them the packet from, to send, resend them the planning board packet that includes those questions or send out the separate questions if you want. But I like the way the, the questions the and report. selection criteria, yeah. Okay. I like the way it all fits together because you've got like the vacancy notice, you got the selection criteria, you got okay. the questions because then they can say, well, you know, when I reread that notice of what the ZBA does, I realized we should really ask a question about X, Y, Z, but I don't like them just like making up questions out of whole cloth so and I, expecting them to go find the report is asking a lot. So, <laughs> I, so, so I will send, and I'll probably just do it when we adjourn this meeting, so yeah. I will send a request for questions that will have attached to it the selection guidance for ZBA that we just adopted, yeah. the January 27th, report to the town council, which, which was about the planning board. Yeah. And I will also send them the committee handout for the ZBA. Would that be useful as well? Yeah. Okay. I think, I think that would be really valuable. And in fact, you could even, you know, while you're doing it, you might as well send them the vacancy notice that you sent out too. I mean, really, it's, it's like the pre-written version of your report, right? It's all, it's a bunch of the piece parts from okay. the eventual report. The other question I have about ZBA is we still haven't figured out what is gonna be the process for figuring out current associate members? Did we have a chance, when I mean, did you get a chance, to ask the current associate members if they were even planning to stay beyond June 30th, and if or with not they were planning to stay, would they be interested in being full members? Because that's part of the mix here, right? Is we, before we make, it doesn't have yep. to be, no, we don't have to know okay. it before the interviews, but we have to know it before we decide. So I, in my email to the chair, I asked a question, um, well, I guess the question I asked was about uh, reappointment of associates and whether they've been impaneled. Um, I, I got a cryptic answer. Um, and so I think that I just need to reach out to the staff liaison and ask that question. So I'll try and get that information for the 30th. Yeah, I was just gonna recommend that you ask the staff liaison to simply pull the ZBA associates okay. and say we're we're under you know that, that we have vacancies and we're trying to figure out who's interested in continuing so to in serve and 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 in relatedly because I'm thinking this this filling the ZBA vacancy is going to be so much more complicated than the planning board yeah. just because we ha also have this division between regular and associate members and so in, in theory we could play musical ZBA chairs yeah. um, so I will ask whether they're interested in continuing to serve. And also, I should probably also ask whether they would be interested in a regular membership. Because maybe they, maybe 
they don't, right? They, they like being in position. Okay. Okay. I think I understand all of my homework. Um, great. Well, that was fun. So, um, with that, our next meeting, again, I believe is March 30th. And I am then going, there's no public, so there is no public, there's no public presence, so we have no public comment. Uh, and with that, I am going to adjourn us at 11.33 a.m. Thank you.